Chapter 1 Stranger Tides Sometime around midnight, I close up the plant in Roswell, New Mexico. I'm like sitting at the wheel of my 1972 Chevrolet Chevelle convertible. You know, the one that's blue with white stripes and a white top and eight cylinder front mounted engine. And the whole time I got this guy in the left lane who is riding my bumper all the way from work and going all over the place and you know in your gut that he's going to crash into you and the whole time he's behind that wheel he's like move out of the way old lady I'm going to the zoo and I'm thinking to myself I'm a man in his early 20s who is this guy yelling at everybody else is not going to the zoo if you haven't already figured that out and neither is this guy. He's probably going to jail and potentially prison where they have terrible food and a lady named Sheila who works in laundry. So first things first, I pull over to the side of the road and I hear a train coming as this guy gets out of his car. It's an El Camino. Ridiculous notion. I mean, who mixes a truck with a sports car. Elvis? Well, I think there's a reason he left Earth. I've got my foot raised on the gas, ready to put that sucker back in drive, and get the hell out of Dodge when this guy says something. And I don't know what it was, but he pulls out a 12 gauge from his trench coat, and I'm like, oh shit. So I duck down, but it's too late. He's got me, I'm a goner. You win some, you lose some. So now I'm a ghost. And like all ghosts, you look at a fatty eating a cheeseburger and you just think to yourself, if only I could punch this guy's lights out. But what am I to do? Well, that's when I met Doc. No, not Doc Holliday. This guy's a dude who used to work over at the plant with me. We had met maybe once or twice over coffee. So anyways, he can see me. Well, the dead anyways. I'm in the hopes that he'll get me back to my body. Because this guy's smart like hella smart. He has an IQ of 360. I mean, that's a full circle. But turns out, no can do. So I'm stuck in the funny farm or the graveyard. Take your pick. By the way, that plant that I work at its deep cover they use it to house alien spaceships and all kinds of crazy bogus stuff plus we sort of have this special ops team yeah they're heroes all right there's daisy she's nice to spy on in the shower but she always knows i'm there gotta love a woman with a sixth sense right has a very dirty sense of humor she can bend things with her mind, psychic. Spoons, metal bars, communists. She got hijacked by the FBI when she was a kid. Originally, she worked for the Russians as a sleeper agent. But Doc turned her with his undeniable logic. Great minds think alike. Plus, she can't age. The Russians did this thing to her reproductive system. Wowza. Next, you got Pantheon who can go to this other realm that's like a third dimension. He calls it the deep. I call it creepy. Even for a ghost, you don't want to get sucked in there. Too many hypotheticals. Besides, I think he keeps his dead girlfriends in there. He's a predatory alien, takes over planets. Doc has this magical contract that keeps him in line, says, you shall not touch Earth or some crap like that. Whatever. Personally, I'd watch the guy. He seems to get hungry every now and then. Plus, anything not human that looks human is way above my pay grade. After that, you have Roscoe. Don't ask me what his power is. He won't talk about it. But a couple of GIs found this little boy out in Afghanistan in a Taliban mosh pit, covered in blood. 
when they took him in for questioning, let's just say it didn't go too well, and it almost started a secret nuclear war. Personally, he says he's Brazilian, and I take him at his word. Don't mess with Roscoe. Anyone who hasn't reached puberty yet is definitely a feisty one. Then there's me, obviously. I mean, what can I do? Well, I can speak to the dead. I'm like a mediator. Doc says real ghosts are rare, because most people go to the other side either up or they go down. Personally, I don't prefer the latter. I'm partial to the place that doesn't burn me alive for eternity. All in all, a good assortment of characters. And I've got just one problem, and it makes me angry as hell. Who shot me? I asked Doc the next morning. You see, there's this unconscious period that doesn't help when you're trying to follow a perpetrator from the great beyond, and it occurs right after you die. Some people call it the summoning of the light. I call it bull. I don't know, said Doc. Perhaps it was the Russians. They're always watching us. Daisy didn't take too kindly to that as she snapped Doc's pencil. Roscoe held my case file. All personnel murders must be investigated. Why on earth do we have to investigate this bozo? He's a damn janitor. I mean, it's not like he does anything good around here. Hey, I quipped. Oddly, everybody on the team can see me just fine and hear me. I resent that. When's the last time you cleaned up a severe, severed head out of a gym locker? Wasn't me, replied Pantheon, picking his teeth with a toothpick. I left that girl back at the bar. Right, said Daisy curtly. Just like a 1950s housewife. Smoking. No, seriously, she was smoking. Well, said Roscoe, at least we can hope for a fun evening. I'll track the scent. Can he do that, I asked. Daisy looked up from her Virginia Slim. I guess so. She got up out of her seat, and the rest of us followed. Doc was probably figuring math equations in his head or something. He was looking up and to the left, so we boarded a chopper. Let me rephrase that. The living boarded the chopper. I had to float sideways out the window and hope to God that the blades didn't suck me in. Daisy found it quite entertaining. Pantheon and Roscoe were not amused in the slightest. So yep, there you have it. I was case number 242. They labeled it janitor, like I was nothing more than a mop monkey to them. Good luck scrubbing those toilets, secret agents. I was in the big leagues now. We headed over Bitter Lake National Wildlife Refuge. So I asked Doc, so where are we headed? He goes, what? I can't hear you over the blades. So I say it again, where are we headed? This time I shouted it. Doc smiles, we're just going to my favorite restaurant for lunch. We'll start your personnel case in about an hour. Besides, I have to solve some quadratic equations for a proof. He looked up and to the left. After we got out of Milnesad, Doc wiped some jelly off his lip from the diner. So, Ghosty, we got a call from one of our agents in China. We believe the dude who shot you was a North Korean dignitary named James Bickle. Why he's got that name, don't ask me. He's actually American-born. He defected after 12 years in the military. Navy Admiral. Came out of Annapolis, where he was stationed. Secret Ops. He was spotted at the consulate. They said they'd put tabs on him until we got there. Okay, let's round everybody up. Jimmy was my handler. He wasn't too bright of a kid. It was only until I learned the ropes, but I was totally fine with it. Occasionally, we had our bonding moments. He had a near-death experience in Gitmo. One of the prisoners stabbed him in the neck with a dime. 
So are you seeing anyone? I asked Daisy as we loaded into the chopper. She gave me the finger. Then she smiled. I was in. Yes. Now to figure out the mechanics. Jimmy looked at his seatbelt just as we were crossing over the Pacific Ocean. About half an hour or 15 minutes into our trip, there was a thread sticking out from the buckle. He pulled it. I looked down beneath him and that's when I saw the flashing red light turn from red to green. No, I yelled, but it was too late. Jimmy was a goner. As the chopper burst in the air, we all ended up in the middle of the blaze treading water. Pantheon escaped into the deep dimension. Doc calculated the least harmful trajectory. Roscoe turned into a fish, a tuna to be exact, although I'm not sure if that species lives this far out or not. Daisy bent one of the chopper blades and used it like a surfboard, and then she spooned it into a metal bowl kind of shaped disc so that we all had something to sit in. And I, well, I was already dead and just floated in the air in a kind of shock. If ghosts can have shock or that sort of thing. When I finally floated down to the makeshift canoe, everyone was inside and Doc was fishing out parts from what was left of the chopper. Supposedly, if he could dry the circuits in the switchboard, he could make a radio. Who knew? So is anybody up for a game of cards, I asked. Silence. Well, I guess I'm going to take a nap. I would have naturally assumed that ghosts had no reason to sleep. But I guess that wasn't the case. I fell asleep right there in the bowl. Roscoe covered me with a blanket. The only problem was there was none on the helicopter. And this one was definitely not military. Strange dude, but nice. So is anybody going to tell him? I could hear Daisy laughing. I had no idea what she was laughing at. Apparently there was some kind of secret powder in the bomb that could melt spectral energy and she could see me glowing through the blanket, naked. Interesting, said Doc as he jabbed me with the radio. Hey, I said, I felt that. Doc looked confused. What do you mean you felt that? Ghosts can't feel. I yawned. Tell me in the morning. That's when I fell asleep. I woke up with the odd taste of seawater in my mouth. Yep, I was alive again. This day just kept getting better and better. Guys, what the? I asked, but nobody was there. I looked up to see a man pointing a stick in my face. We were not on Earth, I could tell that, because I had washed up on some kind of weird echochasm. I had no idea what an echochasm was, but I was in it, and these things did not look friendly. Yan! shouted the creature with long tentacles for a face. Hibachi! Don't move, said Pantheon. The spear was pointed at my ribs. Where the F are we? I asked, gritting my teeth. The deep, said Pantheon. How long have we been here? I asked as I got jabbed in the ribs again rather hard. My stomach lurched and I threw up. Pantheon just dropped something out of view from the creatures with the sharp pointy things. Yes, I know it's called a spear. Don't get me twisted. He nodded his creepy alien head. Get it, get it, he said, gritting what looked like teeth. His tongue slipped out. I looked, rolled my eyes, and grabbed it with my toes. It felt raw in between there with the salt water and sunburn. The sea creature shouted something to his compadre and got me up on my feet. Gashi! Gain! He said again, except this time with more vigor. I could feel the sharp end of the spear headed right for my heart. I did not want to argue with this guy. They shoved me up onto the deck of a flagship with a dark sail. They were pirates, whatever they were. In Pantheon's world, I have no idea what they could be. They threw me across the deck. Gashi! Neil! said the creature to my right. They hauled Pantheon, screaming, down to the bottom of the deck. Serves the guy right for dragging me down into this nightmare. I could hear him. 
Remember, remember who you are. You are then a thud. Silence except the bowing of the waves up and down against the hull. That's when I saw this cat crawl up from down below. Must have been a Maine Coon. I loved Maine Coons. My father used to breed them back in St. Louis on our farm when I was a child. That's how he made his living. Things were worth a fortune. There was even a wait list. Now if I could only find Doc and the others. Well, Pantheon wouldn't be too hard to find. That's when something weird happened. The Maine Coon stood up like a human. I never seen a cat stand up like a human. He had one eye missing and a hook for a paw. His left paw. Thank you, SJ, said Mr. Pirate Maine Coon. I don't know what the heck Pantheon was smoking in his secret lair, but it was good. Give me some of that TLC, man. That will be all, Simone, replied large pure bread cat. What the, I quipped, and then I felt a razor sharp hook clawing into the top layer of my neck. Did I say you could speak, asked the furry guy. I gulped. This was not my show, the cat spoke. Do you know who I am? And why you are here, Mr. Eisenhower? No, and I would prefer that you call me by my first name, Ed, I replied in remark. Yes, Mr. Ed, I'm looking for something, and you have it. I don't know if we have been introduced before, but you can call me Tafters, said the feline. I giggled at the name. <laughs> I was very hungover from the helicopter crash incident. You think that's funny, he said questioningly, like you really wanted to know. He continued this time, shouting below deck. Come on, S.J., he laughed at my name. What kind of name is Tafters for a pirate if the human isn't even scared of it? S.J. came up from quarters. You could always name yourself Mr. Tater Tots or Finkelstein the Savage, he said with a grin. I just burst out laughing manically. Man, that seawater had gotten to my head or that was just about... The dumbest name choices I had ever heard. Worse than Tafters. What, you don't like it? Asked Tafters with a frown. I even got it on my boating license. See, it says it here. He held up a card with the picture of a one-eyed cat with an eye patch on it. It read, National Game and Wildlife, TJ Tafters. I just chuckled. Man, you have got to tell me who your mother was, because that is just sick. What kind of hairball names are kid Tafters? You must have been the runt of the litter. Did you get picked on in school? I'm just saying, get that Xerox, I told him. The captain didn't look too pleased. Take him to the roper, he said, obviously not smiling. The roper, I questioned. Who's the roper? Man, that doesn't sound like a picnic. That's when they shoved me down below deck. I could see several blades being sharpened for some particular head severing reason. Oh my God, I said as I watched a rather large animal being brutally put to death. Now guys, hopefully that is not my fate. You guys are sending me to Hawaii, right? I know my plane ticket, said Malibu. This is the Four Seasons. I'm going to close my eyes and count from one to three. Okay, one, two, three. When I opened my eyes, I was standing before a small bamboo cell that barely looked like it could fit a grapefruit, let alone a human being. Pantheon was laying sideways and it's crumpled up into a ball. No, not Pantheon. The guy was a legend around the lunch tables where the janitor ate. I mean, they were short-staffed down at the plant. It was a union thing and lawsuits, you know, that sort of thing. Anyways, for the time being, they could only hire one janitor to clean up severed heads and randomly stuff them into a broom closet. Not that I ever did. 
I also may have eaten lunch in there just so the guys wouldn't pick on me. You know, supers. They can get a little testy at times, especially the Russian ones when you end up mopping too close to her collection of bent glass. Why she has it, I don't know. It's made of ashtrays. Your guess is as good as mine. Shut up and stay in there, said SJ, as he put a rope around my neck and stuffed me in the bamboo box, crying my eyes out. What? Crying is a very manly thing. I could feel the cord tighten as the tentacle face guards went up above deck. Pantheon whispered something into my ear. I couldn't hear him between my loud screams. Then I whimpered. Remember, he said, remember who you are. That's when something even weirder happened. I had this sort of fuzz appear in my head, and I saw Doc talking to Roscoe back at the plant. We have to tell him. His life could be at stake here, Doc. Whose life, I questioned. Then Doc talked to somebody I couldn't see behind his steel beam. Get this to the lab quickly. We have to make it fast. Make what, I asked, but then it was gone. I looked over at Pantheon. He gave a slow sigh, and then his head went low. Is he dead, I asked. The thin air, but nobody answered. Pantheon, man, I'm wigging out. If this is your realm, you're the only guy who can get me out of this place. Come on, how do I perform CPR on an alien crash dummy? CPR, anybody? A lizard-like creature smiled at me, sharpening his executioner's blade. What's up, I said solidly. He laughed. That's when I felt the boat lift off and rise into the air. A foghorn blasted. The paper I remembered, the paper. It took me forever to get my toe up to my neck without choking myself to death. Luckily, I had taken gymnastics in the third grade through college. When I got it, there I looked at the odd-seeming equation. It was a formula, but some of the numbers were missing. Where was Doc when you needed him?